Imagine putting on a headset to explore uncolonized prairie as part of a Lakota bison hunt, or pointing your phone at objects to learn their names in your family's language, or even touring modern cities with indigenous virtual tour guides. While the immersive technologies already exist, communities around the world are still working together to solve issues around natural language processing for indigenous languages. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by Michael Running Wolf, Northern Cheyenne, Lakota, and Blackfeet, who was raised in a rural prairie village in Montana with intermittent water and electricity. Naturally, he has a master's of science in computer science, is a former engineer for Amazon's Alexa, and is an instructor at Northeastern University. He was raised with a grandmother who only spoke his tribal language, Cheyenne, which, like many indigenous languages, is near extinction. By leveraging his advanced degree in professional engineering experience, Michael hopes to strengthen the ecology of thought represented by indigenous languages. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. You have so much that you do, it's hard to know where to start, but could you tell us a little bit about some of the current work you're doing with speech recognition? So in the past year, I have been working with an organization that co-founded to study automatic speech recognition for the Waukesha languages. And this is the Waukesha AI Consortium. And it was initially funded by MIT Solve with Sloan funding from the Sloan Foundation and also the McGovern Foundation. And so in the past year, what we've been doing is fundamental and foundational machine learning research into building automatic speech recognition or speech to text for under resourced languages and specifically in the Northwest, the Waukesha languages. And these are the Kwakwala and the Macaw languages. They're in Washington state and also in British Columbia. For the listener that may not be familiar, when you say machine learning to do these kinds of speech recognition tasks, what do you mean by machine learning? Like what would be the lay explanation? Machine learning is big. And specifically what we're working with is the field of using deep neural nets to do phoneme recognition for the language and also doing grammar recognition. And then to maybe explain that a little bit more simply is we're taking indigenous audio and we're training modern neural net models to recognize the sounds of the language and also the grammar and structure of the language, which is currently under-researched within machine learning. And when we say speech to text, the output there would be to be able to tell your phone what to do, but in your native language. Like what would your end goal be there? And is it also stuff like being able to have maybe a web browser do assisted reading or that kind of thing too? So the goal is to put on a headset and speak in either an AR or VR, or even your phone, and have a voice user experience as part of a VR experience or game. And that part is solve. I mean, it's still difficult and requires engineering effort. But what's harder is actually the most boring part is the API. So what happens is that you have an application It could be the website or it could be your phone, similar to Siri, and it sends your audio file, like an MP3 typically, and it would send it to the cloud and it would need to be recognized by the AI model. And the AI model will then convert this waveform data and it will convert it into text data, which is more usable when you're programming. And then when you have the text data, you can do a lot of interesting things. You could create rules based upon the responses or you can create natural language understanding. Like when you say, turn on the light, your waveform goes to the server and gets turned into a text and that text then goes to a natural language understanding system and says, okay, this means turn on the light. So the hard part is also the unseen part, the recognition of the audio. And this hasn't been done for indigenous languages previously. Are you like the first? No, fortunately there is work within the space. There has been research on larger indigenous languages like the Maori. Dene or Navajo. There's also research around Enictotuk. The key thing, though, is that what we're focusing on is the specific issue of polysynthetic languages. 
polysynthesis to try to summarize that is that English is a atomic or isolate language. And so there's these things called morphemes and the morpheme just means the smallest amount of sound used to convey information. And so like you say, the red car, you have three morphemes, the, the red car. In polysynthetic languages, words are constructed of multiple morphemes. And so like train cars, they can connect together and arbitrarily be long. And so the ramifications here are that these languages have an infinite amount of words. And so there are as many words as there are stars in the sky. The issue is that current modern automatic speech recognition assumes that there's a finite dictionary. And so typically when you're speaking to Siri, there's assumption that there's like a statistical corpus and as a process of automatic speech recognition, it goes through kind of like a spell check because the phony recognizer isn't perfect. And so what happens is it uses a statistical version of the grammar, which is a large text corpus. And it works fine if you have a large text corpus, like every single book ever written that's been scanned and digitized, but it won't work for a language that a word may only be spoken once in the lifetime of the universe because it's highly contextualized and highly dense. And the languages you're working with right now, is there a large corpus for them? These audio recordings, are there a lot of speakers for these languages? Unfortunately, no. The languages we're working with are the Waukeshaun languages in the language family of the Waukeshaun, and they are considered the most polysynthetic languages in North America and potentially the world. And that's why we work on them. And then simultaneously, they also some of the most researched. Unfortunately, a lot of the text corpus and documentation is still analog, like it's handwritten. There's a lot of early 1900s work but it's all in handwritten notes by um, anthropologists, but they do have a large audio data set. It's unannotated, untranscribed, and like most indigenous languages in North America, have virtually no documentation and virtually no text corpus. So the technical problem we're trying to solve is how do we reduce or eliminate the necessity for that large text corpus and also simultaneously deal with the fact that we also have a very low amount of speakers. For English and French and German automatic speech recognition, you have millions of potential speakers and you have centuries of written word in which to build your text corpus. And we don't have that. Our goal is that if we address that with the Waukesha languages, which from the technical perspective, the hardest languages, we could then scale that to other languages in North America. They're very interesting languages from a scientific perspective, and they're just interesting languages in general. I don't want to impose a value system upon the languages. All the languages are important and sacred. But these languages, the benefit with working with them is that they're highly documented. It's possible to create manual rules based upon the documentation. They're well known in the field of linguistics and computational linguistics. And so our expectation is that we can use that pre-knowledge to accelerate the machine learning process. So does a model for a polysynthetic language look different than a language with a finite dictionary? Yes. Well, English is a strange language, quite frankly, <laughs> uh, relative. <laughs> but these languages are just different across the board. They have different sounds in them, completely incompatible phonetically with English and the all European languages. And then the structure, the grammar, the morphology is quite a bit different. And so from the AI perspective, it's a two-phase process. There's the phonetic recognition, you know, the sounds of the language. We'll use a deep neural net model. And for the grammar and structure, we'll be a little more manual. There will be AI involved in machine learning, but we will be using like manual coded rules. They're called finite state transducers to help recognize the grammar. And who else is working with you on this? I mean, you're obviously not doing all this work alone. So who's your team? Do you have linguists and computer science people, or is it mostly computer science people? Thankfully, I'm not alone. So there's the community partners, first and foremost. Nothing can get done without the help and the work with the partners who share this vision for building AI for indigenous languages, the Macaw and Kwakwala. In addition to that, our tech team is composed of a, a linguist. His name is Connor Quinn. He lives in Portland, Maine. And we also have a data scientist, my good friend, Sean Sosi. He lives in Seattle. And then the boss of bosses, my wife, who's a, uh, currently getting her PhD at the University of British Columbia. And by community partners, are you talking about people that are in the tribe? And are there also issues there related to non-exploitive use of the language or who would own the tech? First and foremost, as part of this research is to respect indigenous data sovereignty. 
I'm an outsider, even though I myself am indigenous, I'm Native American from Montana. I'm an outsider to these communities. And the goal of the technology isn't to create a data set to exploit, you know, either for personal or academic or commercial use. The data set, the full ownership is going to stay with the community. The goal of this research is to develop methodology and algorithms and tooling to accelerate the documentation and creation of AI for these indigenous languages. For me and for us, it's really the development of the technology that will scale because the community fundamentally, it's their data. These are their stories. These are stories and data points that are deeply tied to the identity of the people. Like for instance, these are stories of their creation. These are voices from their elders their ancestors, like uh, grandmothers and grandparents that are no longer with us. And so I fundamentally, as a business person, feel uncomfortable trying to claim ownership of this data set. Where I would say is that we're borrowing it with their help to build this technology. And they also understand that they have buy-in because they have desire to use this technology in their community. So that's also critical. It's a back and forth relationship. And so we're trying to reciprocate what we're doing with them. So that what we're doing has community ramifications for them. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's interesting and cool. And I get to play with toys. But at the end of the day, the community gets a system to help them accomplish a task. Like for instance, the Kwakwala community we're working with, they want to annotate that huge archive it turned it into searchable text because it's really hard to search hundreds of hours of audio. They don't know what's in there. It's hard. It's a hard task. Search and archive auto. And the Macaw community want educational tools. They see the potential where we would use this ASR technology to create learning experiences where students can go on the phone or on the website and practice the language. I get that the data set would stay under the tribe to preserve data sovereignty, but will your technology itself be patented? And who's going to hold the patent? Or is that not how you're doing things? Yeah, I think there's quite a bit of value to it. I think there's like a hidden question in there. It's like, what's the value of the code without the data set? Obviously, the data set has value, but we're not interested in that. But yes, I believe the technology and the methodology would be very valuable. And I think as a way of being sustainable, we would need to, just by necessity, we're in a capitalist system, <laughs> maximize its value. We all get bills to pay. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Yeah, our data scientist just had a daughter and we need to help him buy Pampers and uh, our, our linguist has a cat and you know, like we gotta make sure they have kitty litter. There's practical reality, we do need to finance this. And of course we've been fortunate to have support the foundations and also exploring the possibility of how to maximize the IP of this code and the methodology to make it sustainable. But the goal ultimately is to do the foundational research. Whatever form that takes, it will be broadly accessible is our goal. We're not quite sure. We're still definitely in the first ground floor of working on this. There are 500 plus recognized tribes in North America and nearly 90% of them are endangered. A depressing amount is very nearly near extinction. Like the UN has like a measure of how endangered the language is. And most languages in North America are most critical, most endangered level. And most of those languages are polysynthetic and would fall within the domain of this research. Also, my personal language, my family languages are polysynthetic as well. Uh, Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne, and I'm part Blackfeet. They're all part of the Algonquin language family. And that's probably going to be our next target language family because Algonquin languages span from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast and to Boston. It's a large language family. And the, most of those languages, of course, are endangered or at risk of being endangered. One of the outcomes of this particular work may also be preservation. Is it possible that you could have this stuff modeled and the machine learning model of that language might be the only place that language exists anymore? Is that what preservation might look like or would the goal be to get more people speaking it? There's two embedded questions in there. So I guess one question is, is this a mechanism for archiving the language long-term? And potentially, it's another goal. I would love to see, not toward the goal of putting it in the museum, but a box, a self-contained language in the box, a little handheld device that's battery powered and it could become a keepsake that a family could own for generations. And in there, a self-contained AI and programming so that it would teach you basics of the language. And I think that would be an endearing output of this research so that in the future, people could teach your grandchildren using this box. It's self-contained, no dependency upon the cloud. Of course, it's very private, which would be good, but that's not the goal. 
I could see that being a use case, but I think the main goal is to reinforce present day educational systems. Like even the most endangered languages where there's only a handful of speakers, they are heroically working to revitalize and reclaim their language. You know, preservation is sticking in the museum and keeping the dust off it. But I think reclamation and revitalization is reintroducing the language into the everyday and making it a living languages and reinforcing that. And that's where I see this technology is you can speak in Northern Cheyenne or Macaw to turn on your lights, walk into a room and say, hey, turn on the lights in your language. That makes it ambient and that makes it kind of part of your day to day. And it allows you to participate in the modern AI economy that's coming, the voice activation economy that's coming. So that's the main goal, but I could foresee that being an amazing archival tool as well. Right? Wow, it's fantastic. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thanks for joining us, Michael. I want to start with the ecology of thought and sort of the context of how you're recording these languages and working with them. I mean, we talked a little bit about how when you're incorporating language use into your daily life, it becomes more meaningful, more sort of a part of you. So what does the ecology of language mean to you and how does it play into your work? I like the phrase ecology of thought because there is a direct correlation between ecological health and language diversity within an area. Like even in North America, where most people speak or nearly everyone speaks English. But if there happens to be any kind of language diversity, the local ecology, it seems to benefit. I don't think language is making plants grow better. <laughs> I think what's going on is that the diversity of people are simply just it's demonstrating the strength of local cultures, which values ecology and the environment. And so like indigenous peoples tend to be on the forefront of ecological preservation. For instance, a lot of my family in South Dakota and North Dakota were part of the pipeline protest in Standing Rock. And I was out there with the virtual reality cameras years ago. And language was definitely a part of that, the Lakota language and other languages in the region, like Ojibwe and Cree. And so I think it's also very important that having different languages within yourself as an individual, just makes you a better person. Like, like if you speak multiple languages, you're generally better at math and all these other things being polyglot. My wife's a polyglot and she's like a literal genius, but she grew up in Europe, you know, and I think that's kind of missing from the American experiences, being expected to speak different languages. I'm a, a big fan of the Worf Sapir theory where, you know, the language you speak actually affects the way you think. The theory has been shown to be kind of simplistic, but I think there's still ramifications of having how a language affects your, your research. I'm not a linguist, so I can't speak with authority on Worf Sapir, but I see it in my day to day. I see how I grew up with my family and how different situations were contextualized using language. Like if my parents wanted to talk about something very sensitive, they would often revert to their indigenous languages just because it was something complex and English is kind of a simple language. I was always told that as a kid growing up, you know, the English is just sort of like working with crayons <laughs> versus <laughs> using these more elevated languages. And that's not to say that English is a bad language. I ran across one of the projects that you worked on, the Huaki app. Is that how you say it? Uh, Huaki. Huaki? Yeah, there's like a little glottal stop or like an apostrophe. Huaki. Huaki. 
yeah. the Huaki'i app. And it just seems like it had so much potential for language learning in that younger generation, because you can literally just take your phone and point it at something and it gives you the word in the target language, right? And was developed for Hawaiian. But do you want to tell us a little bit about how you made it expansible so that other language holders could adapt it? Yeah, so uh, Hiwaki'i, which is uh, Hawaiian, and I'm not fluent Hawaiian, so I may get this wrong, but it means roughly image retriever, and it also means small fruit or something. And so it was intentionally chosen to be kind of like a cute word with multiple meanings. So there's a lot of depth to even just the name itself, Hiwaki'i. And there's this project out of Concordia University in Montreal um, to develop indigenous protocols. Uh, and that's like indigenousai.net. And we developed a resistance paper on how indigenous peoples can interact with AI as it's becoming more of an issue. This was in 2019. And the organizers made the mistake of inviting four engineers, <laughs> and <laughs> data scientists, myself, and you know, from across the globe, in you know, Australia, New Zealand, us in America, and Hawaiian, and we just sort of turned it into a hackathon. We're like, so we're all here. It's kind of cool. It's very rare that you get a handful of technical people into the same room and. So we just built something, and that was who a key. The thought process was, instead of writing the paper, which we all engineers didn't want to write the paper, we were like, okay, <laughs> we'll just do something and to demonstrate what we're talking about. And so since we were in Hawaiian lands, since we were guests here in Hawaii, we should do something for the Hawaiians. And there were Hawaiian community members as part of us. And so we took this AI model, an open source AI model that uses the, it's called the Coco data set. And it recognizes 80 objects in there. It was a good evaluation of how AI is biased because these 80 objects were random and simultaneously were very hyper-specific to San Francisco. Like this idea of the fire hydrant. The fire hydrants in the Bay Area are kind of weird, <laughs> honestly. Like you think of the classical fire hydrant, they don't have those uh, in San Francisco. They're kind of these weird things and that are specific to the, the Bay Area. And so we had a tough time trying to find a fire hydrant that just was recognized by this model, which is kind of like a demonstration of bias, uh, how the data you feed your AI model biases toward what it recognizes. And, and also it recognized things that had no context to Hawaiian, like skiing and dock hoons. You know, like wiener dogs was recognized. When you build use AI and you integrate it into your day-to-day -day life, you've kind of taken the opinion of the engineers that created the AI in the first place. And so we, what we did is take a recognition of an object, like a cup or a bowl, and that gave an English word back, like literally cup, and then created a translation dictionary and like a layer. So like we were working with Hawaiian language experts. And in the course of recognizing even just 80 words, the language speakers had to invent words. Thankfully, Hawaiian has a flexibility in the way it's constructed. And so we were able to do that for many words or words that just made no sense, like ski, for example, it just was never translated. And so we open sourced everything. It's all on GitHub. And if you go to huaki, H-U-A-K-I-I dot indigenous AI dot dev, you'll be able to see it and you'll be able to click on the little icon and fork it for yourself and create your own version. I've done presentations where non-technical people can create their own version of this in their own language and within 10 to 15 minutes. It's pretty simple. There's instructions on a GitHub page. So that lets you both enter in new objects, but also map to a new language that wasn't previously in the model. Am I understanding that correctly, or is it just the language part? Only the language part, the AI model would require retraining. And that's the first thing people ask about. Like, I think it's natural, which is great. I think that invites discussion. When we introduce these to the indigenous communities, we've done this in presentations, the authors of this software and I, and that's the first question that leads into this discussion of how AI is biased and how our personal relationship with AI is important, how communities relationship with AI is important and, and to address that. Indigenous and AI, an organization that I uh, founded to get more indigenous peoples into machine learning and artificial intelligence. We and our fiscal sponsors, Natives in Tech, just got a large uh, McGovern Foundation grant. And so we would be conducting a Lakota AI code camp in South Dakota this summer to do the harder part, which is to modify the image recognition. So the goal of that code camp will be to 
create a Lakota version of the object recognition and teach students how to do that and actually contextualize the AI itself, not just the surface language layer, but the actual AI. And that also comes back to what you were saying earlier, though, because if that AI image recognition is more useful and broader in your day-to-day -day life, then it feeds back into using the language. I think you said it makes language more ambient. Yeah, I think it's critical also to, and um, it's not me just doing it alone. I have partners, people within Natives and Tech and my friends, people basically, people that are part of the Waukeshaan AI Consortium are helping me. We like, why don't we broaden this, you know, using open source technology, open source AI models and methodologies too. And it's called transfer learning. Basically we do is take an existing model and you can re-modify it. And it's easier to modify an existing model than to create a whole new one. And, and that's what we would teach. And so I think given empower in the community to recontextualize from ground up, the AI, I think is very critical and giving them empower and uplifted communities to do that is very critical in my opinion. What happens when there's people in the communities that you're working with who disagree about how the language should be collected or used or like even what the words are? Like if you say backpack this way and I say backpack that way, how do you resolve the disagreements? The resolution isn't to choose a winner, I guess. I'm not trying to sidestep the question. It's a question that I've been struggling with myself. So take, for instance, my mother's tribe, the Cheyenne. There's two major languages in the Cheyenne. They're considered dialects, but they're distinct. And dialects is kind of a bad word sometimes to certain communities. But historically, the official Cheyenne language isn't the language that my family speaks. And so there's always been this tension of the official language. It's almost federally recognized to an extent. It's just really, it's what's propagated. There's no law saying you have to speak the official Cheyenne versus the Cheyenne that my family spoke. There's this been contention because the official language always gets the resources, the grants, there's federal grants to protect languages and revitalize languages. And our language has never considered that. And so my solution is why not empower the individuals of every language community, even languages within a quote unquote one tribe can empower themselves to create their own technology. Like take, for instance, being able to modify Hua Ki'i is like a really good example of that. Like why not every dialect have their own version of Hua Ki'i? So then there's no contention. Every, the, the software is free, the software is easy to modify, and then you're not favoring and picking winners or losers. We shouldn't be creating language Darwinism, certainly not with AI technology. Do you think colonial structures have impacted the overall picture of indigenous language endangerment by forced assimilation policies or things like that? You're saying the government operates in the one form of the language. Is that common that there's somebody at some point set into place things that favored the evolution of one dialect over another? Oh, absolutely. This isn't a phenomenon limited to the indigenous of North America. This is a problem that happens across the world. Like take, for instance, German. My wife grew up half her life in Germany and she's half German. Her family, her tribal German language is Swedish and it's a minority language within Germany. And so you have this idea of high German. You have this phenomena where the high Germans, the ones in Northern Germany who speak the official language, don't recognize Bavarian because they refuse to. And so you have all these different German languages that aren't recognized and are considered endangered as well. And it's happening in France, it's happening in Italy. And of course, obviously more famously uh, Spain, you know, you have Catalan and these other languages. And so this bias toward having a official language is a problem, especially as we impose it upon languages that have very, very few speakers. So there's not that many Cheyenne speakers, period. And now you're dividing them in half against each other because you're choosing a winner. And so this hurts the language community. And so instead of creating the ecology of collaboration, now there's this antagonistic view of, of resentments caused by these policies. And do you feel like some of the tools that you're building will help obviate that? Yes, I, I hope so. I think it sort of informs that my aesthetic, my technical aesthetic, I have a bias toward technology that is easily extensible and usable in community and can overcome all these different issues. As a technologist, bringing the tools and the toys to a community, I don't want to be the one picking and choosing, you know, like, I, this is the tool in, 
I'll give you my fortune and my luck of having technical capacity and I'm sharing these with you and I hope that you can spread it yourself. Basically, trying to avoid language Darwinism. <laughs> You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thanks for joining us today, Michael. We've been talking a little bit about how context of language impacts your design and your architecture and how you approach building these applications. Can we talk a little bit about how ethical implications of digitizing and recording languages impacts your design process? There is this movement within indigenous communities in response to historic traumas and exploitation of data sovereignty or indigenous data sovereignty. And this is a movement that spans the globe. You know, there's Maori, you know, people in Africa and Asia and in North America and South America. How do we preserve our intellectual property rights from what historically happened to our material wealth? You know, like we have tribal artifacts, physical objects, that have been stolen and put into the museums and private collections and remove them from our community. And we're now as a global movement toward how do we protect our IP, intellectual property, our songs and our ideas and our stories from ha having the same thing happen where people can take in, record their audio and then store it away without giving anything back to the community. So that informs the ethics as part of the ethical design of our project. It's more policy than technical. We don't want any ownership of the audio. A worst case scenario for us would be that we would be forced to relinquish the audio to a third party who is not under the authority of the community. It's very critical that the data that we have is only for the community use and our use. If the community wants to retract our use of their audio, then we would completely respect that. It's also part of the trust building as we're building this technology. We're taking a multilingual approach, and so we need to build relationships with many different communities to build our data set, to build our AI. And it's very important that we demonstrate to our communities who are sensitive to exploitation. And we also consider them partners. They're not research subjects, which is the typical term. They are our partners in building this technology. Quite frankly, they believe in the mission too. Like Sarah, one of our partners in Fort Kwakwala was almost brought to tears and said, our language could contribute to your language's success. My language, Cheyenne, and she was like, that's amazing. How do we help? Let's do this. What about privacy and security in terms of application building? I mean, maybe you have organizational or legal structures in place to keep this from being hijacked by a third party, but do you have privacy and security structures to protect the access or use? Absolutely. I guess from my perspective as an engineer, it's not a technical problem. It's been solved. From a technical perspective, there are strategies and methodologies to secure your data, basically, and practices. Take, for instance, two-factor authentication, making sure that the data can't be accessed without a password plus another authentication system. There's different strategies. One of them is like there's a commercial project called YubiKey. And you never enter only your password. You also enter a random um, number. And I actually encourage you all and listeners to look into <laughs> two-factor authentication. It's very critical. It, it stops a lot of privacy breaches. I would suggest you ensure that your email, your personal email has two-factor authentication set up. And it's pretty simple. And so there's all these different practices and processes that exist. And I also have experience in this area. 
at my former employer, I used to work for the privacy and compliance team. My code helped make it easier to ensure that we were compliant with GDPR and CCPA and all this. And I can't talk too much about that necessarily, <laughs> the NDAs or whatnot. I would love to apply that knowledge towards in business communities. To me, what is unfathomable is the policy framework, like what kind of contracts. I really want to create bulletproof contracts where we have no recourse as an entity, as the engineer using the data over the data. Like I want to make sure that we have no permission to do anything. <laughs> like even though we have agreements in place, but I really want to make sure it's completely legally tied up because these communities, it's their data. And I want to make sure that they're not at risk uh, by anything that we do. You were talking about building trust with the communities, and this isn't a technical issue, but how do you identify who to make the agreements with? I mean, do you end up working with the tribal council, or do you try to get buy-in from every single member of the community if it's a smaller community? You've identified exactly my worry. Most federally recognized communities have either a tribal historic preservation officer or equivalent. And their duty is to make sure that any research being conducted with outsiders, especially cultural specifically, are being conducted correctly. And that too actually would be typically the entity in which you would write the contract. And so, yeah, with the Navajo Nation, which I'm not, but if I was, I would need to get permission from their historic preservation office. And then it's likely they would need to have a resolution passed. But that's not always the case. It's imperfect. That makes it technical. It makes it difficult from a policy perspective. That could be a tricky terrain to navigate in some cases, but it also speaks to your goal of just putting the tools back in the hands of whoever wants to use them. And that seems like it would be a dead issue because they're taking care of it themselves. Absolutely. That's the technical solution is why be the middleman? Let them own the tool and let them own the infrastructure. Whoever wants to use them within that community, right? It's sort of a balancing act, right? Making something that's extensible and easy to use, but also that can be protected by the community from unauthorized use by outsiders. Oh, absolutely. For instance, Hua Ki'i does not have a cloud dependence. All of the recognition happens on the phone. So if you go to the website for Hua Ki'i, the AI application, it's completely offline. There's no privacy issues. I don't see anything that they upload because there is nothing to upload. It's all happening on device, offline. Staying within this sort of framework, you know, you were talking earlier a little bit about going to the pipeline protests. You said you did some virtual reality recording. Yeah, it's a story in itself, but we got funding, me and my wife and a couple of filmmakers, and we got a big experimental camera lended to us from Google, and we were funded by Facebook. And we went out there to build a um, virtual reality um, documentary of the pipeline protests. And we were out there from November until December. This is why I wanted to bring up that particular project. Did you get permission from everybody to record them? Yes. Actually, what we did is we were technically journalists of Yes! magazine. I authored a story as part of that project. We had boilerplate standard reporting releases that people would sign. And so we made sure to not record in public areas. People were very sensitive about having their face because to this day, there's concern. Even back then, there was concern of facial recognition software. And now we didn't want our product to be used against people. So we made sure to be very careful. And yes, we filmed the VR, but we were very careful to make sure that we weren't filming a bunch of people's faces at the same time. And we were being very obvious of what we were doing. So if we were filming in that area, we would tell people, oh, by the way, there's this camera here. You know, step back for a bit while that's going on. Interviews we conducted, we made sure we had permissions and forms being signed. I'm a little curious, going back to some of the work that you did with the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Working Group, that was an international group. Are there materials that you all develop that sort of lays out some of the concerns that can be wrapped into the design process for immersive and machine learning environments? Yeah, so it's a large document in which I contributed a very small portion of which, and I encourage people to look through it and read it because it approaches this perspective of an issue of big data and AI and ethics of building artificial intelligence from a multinational perspective, and there's different essays in there. And this whole effort was led by Jason Lewis, who's a professor at Concordia, and it was funded by CIFAR, which is an organization based in Canada. 
there is a lot of stuff in there to unpack, quite frankly, <laughs> but there's no answer to every possible question, but it does sort of bring forward the different perspectives that different indigenous peoples across the world had toward this issue. When you say this issue, what is that? It's just like a multicultural perspective on AI. You know, like there's issues of ethics of potentially creating a sentient entity composed of electricity versus, you know, the privacy and data sovereignty. I was definitely on more of the data sovereignty topic and how it can contribute to the community. But there's different, more philosophical and esoteric topics also covered in that. It's a big paper. There's a lot of content to unpack. Do you think we'll see a sentient AI in our lifetimes? Probably. But I think it's going to be like fusion power. It's going to be 10 years from now. Like when you think of what is a human, it's an entity that walks, talks, and can play chess, right? And at one point, <laughs> that was the, the test, you know? That was literally the test. Can this thing talk and walk and play chess? You know, but we can create robots that walk and you can create robots that talk. And we have exceptional computers that can play chess. And I suspect, this is me theorizing, that the field of computer science and AI culturally is unable to do it. I think that we're just fundamentally unable to do it because of the culture of our field. I know this is a bit of a philosophical digression, but I think it's fascinating. So what do you mean that the culture wouldn't allow us to do it? I think the people who are into technology, we're all reductionalists, quite frankly. <laughs> we tend to approach problems in a way that assumes that there is a pure reality. Like there's a fundamental truth out there, which I don't believe there is. I, I don't believe there's a one true philosophy or one true language, for example. And that there's a lot of that mentality within the field. Like this is the way, this is the perfect AI can only be constructed this strategy. And I don't think that that kind of mindset is not going to build general artificial intelligence. And so I think it's going to be an interdisciplinary effort Quite frankly, probably by a collective of women engineers, quite frankly, <laughs> um, because you need like this broad perspective and diverse perspective. And I don't think the field is capable of doing it from a cultural perspective. Do you think that if we get to that level, is it possible that we might not even know, though? I would say that I think we may have accidentally, or even just through emergence theory, where if you create the emergence theory, that complexity and then more complexity arises, which is how one way to see evolution. And so I bet we have created the equivalent of early bacteria on the internet. They're not sentient, they're life forms, digital life forms. I wouldn't be surprised if they exist and maybe every once in a while they just arise and then, then maybe they die out because someone turns off a server. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised of that. <laughs> and one day, maybe if we have enough ambient compute power, it just might wake up one day and, and suddenly Siri starts to have a real personality. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. By bacteria, you mean something that's self-replicating and lightly evolving. That's kind yeah. of what you mean by a little yeah. digital life form. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. Before we get into some of the esoteric technical details of the work you're doing in machine learning, I would just like to get kind of a personal story. I mean, in our introduction, you were raised in rural Montana. So how did you get from there to where you are now? If you grew up with intermittent water and electricity, how did you get from there to being a 
really rocking computer scientist. Uh, I don't, I don't think you had a TRS-80 out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. The, the TLDR is that I didn't want to hang out without internet all my life. <laughs> so I, I pursued a technical degree. But honestly, the real reason is my grandparents. I am fortunate enough to be a third generation with a undergraduate degree, which is pretty rare, even for the general population. And that was because of World War II, you know, the GI Bill. My grandfather on my dad's side was a civil engineer, and my mother used to be a laser lithographer for Hewlett Packard. There's just a technical bias, I think, in my family. I think, honestly, it's the grandparents. You know, my family have been very encouraging for us to pursue our, our education. For me, my personal journey was the passion for software engineering was instilled in me by my math teacher. You know, those uh, graphing calculators. And so there's a TI 89 and 85, and you can program them. And I was taking a difficult physics class and there's all these different equations. And I asked my teacher, can I just program them in here? Because I saw in the manual that you can just program in them. And so I was talking to my math teacher and I had complained about my physics class. And he said, yeah, here's the book. And there's a little cable that you can plug into the lab computer. And so I went to go to the lab computer and I would write programs and install them onto the calculator. And then he also printed out the internet. This was like the late nineties. And so you could literally print out everything there was to know about programming for this graphing calculator. And so I taught myself how to code with the help of my math teacher. And that kind of instilled this passion for software engineering. And, and you know, like being a lazy teenager, I accidentally taught myself more than I intended. Because <laughs> when the test finally came, I was going to use the calculator to help me do the test. And I just didn't need it. I programmed all these programs into my calculator in preparation for a test. And I never used it because I just did it by hand. It was faster. <laughs> My friends and I learned to code because we were too cheap to pay for video game software. So we just, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that seems to be like a thing of my dad's generation. <laughs> I hear like all these stories of the graybeards in the industry about how they would go to Radio Shack back when it was a cool place and not what it turned into. And they would just share printouts of code. You know, here's Star Trek, you know, here's a Star Trek game. If you went to Radio Shack, there would basically be about five or six of us. We'd go after school and just catch time on the computers. And, you know, it was funny looking back on it. When I was older, I was trying to figure out why were the employees at Radio Shack letting us do this. But it became a sales tool because they'd have grown-ups coming in asking about buying computers. And they'd say, look, it'll keep your kids home. It'll keep them off. <laughs> it'll keep them off the streets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the mean streets of the 1980s. There are so many possible careers that somebody with mad skills and coding can go into. How did you find a path into AI and then from there into language revitalization? It was a zigzag path, honestly. It looks like a straight path. I started out my college career, academic career, thinking, how can I use this technology for my tribe? Because I knew this problem of data sovereignty was actually something I knew about, uh, something I worried about even young in my academic career. Like, how do we create safe systems so that we could store and archive uh, digital data for indigenous peoples? And so I did a lot of research on security and privacy systems. But then what I was missing was a use case. And so a use case emerged when I met my polyglot wife of language data. Her life passion is language uh, revitalization for her tribe. And, and she kind of instilled in me a use case. Okay, so now we have a privacy center, the content management system. So we want to do language and what does it do? You know, when archives are boring, they don't do anything. So we focus, start thinking about applying this data toward something useful like educational. And we kind of built prototypes and applied for grants. And then eventually we're solidly in the space of wanting to build applications for mobile, for language reclamation and documentation. And so we built a little app that you could record audio and upload it into the cloud for a community. And which is surprisingly still a gap. Recording self-documentation is just this huge unaddressed gap for indigenous language documentation. But anyway, we were presenting this app in Berlin for a conference in 2014. And meanwhile, in my career in computer science, I had kept hearing about VR, but you know, it was like lawnmower man kind of stuff, like from the nineties. And I had tried it once in Austin, Texas in the early 2000s. It was horrible. It's strapped in the CRT, old computer monitor, your face, it's heavy and it barely works and it's just all polygons. 
And so I just never really considered VR a real thing. Like it just always this thing that just never really worked. And so in Berlin, there was this booth from a little company called Oculus that I had never heard of before. And they were demonstrating the technology. And so I tried out the headset and like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it was like a roller coaster. I love roller coasters. I'm afraid of heights, but I love roller coasters. Like put me two feet up without guard handrails and I'll freak out. But it put me in a roller coaster, an airplane, I love it. And I was in this roller coaster and I had that same sensation, you know, when you go to the peak and you're going to go down. And I squealed like a little pig or something. And the guy who was doing the demo had to grab me from behind because I threw myself backwards. <laughs> wow. And there's a video out there of this, by the way. <laughs> my, wife, my wife filmed it all. Uh, and I was hooked. And I said, this is amazing. The first thing that clicked in my head is that when you're doing language education, you need to have a full body experience and seeing this roller coaster sparked in my imagination that like we could use VR to give a full body immersive language experience. And so I started pursuing that. And as a component of that, I pivoted my career. I still am into big data and databases, but I pivoted my career set toward dealing for virtual reality toward this end goal of also having to do voice recognition. And unfortunately, at the time, there just was no research in indigenous language or minority language, uh, automatic speech recognition. And this was sort of like a dead end. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know anything about it. I read papers, but I could barely understand what was going on there. Basically, there was nothing for indigenous languages at that time. Fast forward, I do this VR documentary at Stand and Rock funded by Google and Facebook and doing projects for other companies. And I begin to realize that my skill set wasn't growing and this was happening in Montana. So I was in Montana. I had worked for IBM briefly, but I didn't like the lifestyle living in the Valley. So I went home, got my master's degree and was doing all this VR stuff in the meantime. And there was no VR community in Montana at the time. There was two of us, two people in all of the state who knew how to code VR experiences. And so my wife convinced me ever the brilliant person said, we need to go somewhere where there's actually a large, vibrant VR community. And I immediately ruled out going back to San Francisco, the Bay Area. And so that left Seattle. And so I want to go to Seattle to immerse myself within a VR, XR, you know, mixed reality community. And there was a vibrant community in Seattle. And there's also a lot of VR companies there. Vive was there at the time and Oculus is up there, Facebook and Microsoft's research, the HoloLens. And so I started applying for jobs at Facebook to do in the VR and all these other companies. And meanwhile, I was shopping for iPhone cases on amazon.com. And there was this big banner because the AI must have figured out I was looking for a job and sort of like, get a job at Amazon in five minutes. So whatever, I'll click it. I clicked it and you know, they know all my information, which is kind of spooky. All I had to do was upload my resume and click submit. And literally within two hours, I got a response. Uh, someone called me from the Alexa team. And within two weeks, I had a job offer. It's highly regarded to work for, even at the time, an AI organization. So I knew Alexa, this is cool. I didn't expect to be considered good enough to work for an AI department. Cause it's hard to get an AI job, even now. You have to be considered very good just to work for an AI organization. So I got into Alexa, it was voice AI, and it kind of inspired me. Hey, this stuff actually works. And I started thinking, why don't we do this for indigenous languages? And I took internal training on AI. I pivoted my career set again. And it meant support, by the way. I had a really good experience with my time in Amazon and decided that I needed to apply my skill set in academia to pursue this research. It's a fundamental research that needs to be conducted. That's a really nice segue to a question I had. So I'm presuming you're probably still under some NDA or something with Amazon, but the code work that you did there is proprietary to Amazon. So when you pivoted to start wanting to think about developing these machine learning and AI tools for the indigenous languages and for the, what did you call it, the full immersive language experience, I'm also figuring you did not write everything from scratch. So did you start with an existing AI or machine learning platform? So the good news, I didn't steal any data and I even made, I, went, I also made sure to go through legal review. There was actually a process in Amazon. I was upfront. There's a whole process. You inform the IP lawyers and say, Hey, I'm going to pursue this outside project in my own time to conduct research on indigenous language technology. And that there was like a technical review. That's their concern is that would take the proprietary magic of Alexa and do something in. We were using at the time a uh, open source system developed by Baidu in China for the Mandarin and Cantonese. And 
we were using a fork of that developed by the Mozilla Foundation. And so I had to submit all these documentations, like this is the software we plan to use, these are the community. And I went through a technical review and made sure there was no you know, IP leakage. So the open source technology that we started with was a technology developed by Baidu and then forked by the Mozilla Foundation. The reason for that was in 2019, I met a Maori data scientist who had used this Baidu system for Maori. The Tehiku Media, which is a nonprofit in New Zealand, wanted to revitalize and build AI for their specific language, Maori language. Like I said, in an earlier segment, I was talking about how one language tends to dominate. And so there's an official Maori, but that's only one of many different Maori languages. And so the language community said that we want to be in front of the ball here and build our own system for our language, because we can't expect the government to build the Maori that we actually speak. And so they built their own, which was amazing. I believe they are the first entirely indigenous AI team to build a AI for business languages. And they had taken the framework, this Baidu framework, which is called deep speech. They had taken that framework and modified it for Maori. And they showed me all the augmentations they had to make because it was originally Baidu had in Mozilla had made this for English and German and French, and they had to make modifications. There's just some fundamental problems with trying to make it compatible with Maori. And so using that as a basis, we started our research. And as we got deeper and deeper into the field, my partner who's helping me build the technology, Sean Sosi, who's a data scientist, he realized that we need to build our own. The deep speech framework is great. It works for languages like English and French, but they don't work for polysynthetic languages. Polysynthesis is a spectrum and Maori has polysynthesis, but it's not as polysynthetic as the languages that we're working with in North America. There's also a lot more Maori speakers as well. That's where we started. Now we're building our custom AI system. From a tooling perspective, we're focusing on PyTorch and using open source libraries. It's all in Python for the most part, software wise. And everything's open source that you're creating. Yeah. Right now it's a pile of crazy code, <laughs> as you know. We do have a few tools that are open source for language recording, but the core tool is still under active development. It's research code. It's definitely not productionable. <laughs> Before we end this segment, I have one other sort of technical detail question. So the tools are still under development, but the tools that you're developing, do they run offline? Not yet. We're focusing on the core science portion right now. So as part of that, the first phase is going to be cloud-based. When you do AI, you can spend a lot of engineering effort to make it efficient, or you can make it inefficient and rely upon the cloud. By making it in the cloud, it's a little bit easier. It's more expensive, obviously, because we need to host it, but we'd rather pay hosting fees than engineering time. Because engineering time is always the key limiter. Eventually, though, our goal is to build a fully offline language in a box system. But that's in the future. I think we just need to solve the key technical problems. And efficiency would be the next phase. Because if you have it hosted on a robust server, you can always just throw more memory at it and not worry about the code being super efficient and all that kind of thing and fitting in a little app. I would love it to be something that runs on $50 hardware, like a Raspberry Pi or something. That's the goal, but it does require a fair amount of engineering effort. And that's called Edge AI. That's the future, I believe, Edge AI, where it's privacy oriented and it works offline. But right now we're just focusing on the core. We have a lot of math to do in the meanwhile. <laughs> um, and there'll be more papers. We'll obviously we'll publish our research and grow the community. We have collaborators in time. Yeah, in time. Michael, thank you so much for being generous with your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And if you would like to find out more information about Michael and his work, you can go to LinkedIn online and search for Michael Running Wolf. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.